it, let's say a uh, sparse sparse coding. So what is uh, in, by intuition what is a uh, idea of sparse coding uh, feature representation you want to get, right? Um, first of all, uh, by definition, sparse coding would give you a sparse representation of data. So then uh, each data point, different data point got different uh, uh, um, dimensions activated in a new representation, right? So, um, but uh, by intuition, we, we also want, right, in ideal case, um, similar data point, you know, should get similar, you know, uh, act, um, dimensions activated, right? So if these two data points, they are similar, right? They should get some sparse representations which the share common activated dimensions in a new representation, right? That's a kind of intuition, right? And then if you think along this way, then you might see, okay, so for, uh, suppose for a group of data point following into a local neighborhood, right, they are similar to each other, right, then they should associ be associated to a similar set of dimensions, right. So that means there's some kind of a local association of the codes and the data point, right. So in this case, uh, this is a special case, we call it the local sparse coding, that means um, data in the same neighborhood tend to have shared activated features, right? Um, so in this case, we call it the local sparse coding. But sparse coding is not always local, right? Let me give you one example. So let's uh, look at the left side. In this case, it's more like a kind of independent uh, subspaces or, or ICA type of things, right? So the data point distributed in this way, right? And then you can find two kind of uh, uh, dimensions, right? And each data point, uh, in order to represent, you can get a sparse representation. Just pick up one dimension to represent the data point, right? In this case, you get a sparse representation, right? But it's not local, right? Because, uh, for example, uh, this, this point, and that point, they are pretty different. They are far away, but they activate the same uh, dimension, right? In a in a in a code, right? And then data point, like a uh, uh, kind of close to each other, right? But they activate, uh, you know, different dimensions, right? So in this case, uh, the representation is sparse, but it's not necessarily uh, local, right? Um, so, in the other case, um, let's say uh, those uh, uh, red dots are the, the basis in your dictionary, right? And then to represent a input data point, right? Then you activate the neighboring uh, uh, bases in your dictionary, which are those bases are similar to the to the to this test data point, right? So in this case. Each basis is, is like an anchor point. And then sparsity means each data is a linear combination of neighbor anchors, right? And in this case, the representation is sparse, right? Because if you want to encode this data point, right, you only activate the three bases. Other bases are completely, you know, uh, kind of silent, right? Uh, not activated, right? So uh, then you get a sparse representation. But this sparse sparsity is uh, caused by locality, right? So it's a something kind of a, uh, a special case of, uh, of uh, sparse coding, right? And why I mention this? So uh, if, like pre in the previous uh, here, we, I, what I uh, uh, described the intuition, right? I want to have some, some kind of, in ideal case, Similar data points, so they activate similar dimensions. That means there's some locality association uh, between the bases and the, the local neighborhood of data, right? Um, so kind of a, intuitively, locality is kind of a preferred uh, locality uh, property, right? Then, then we can probably uh, at least develop two type of approaches to 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 derive a kind of local. Uh, localized sparse coding. So the first approach 
is uh, just like the, 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 the example I just mentioned before, that uh, suppose all the bases in your dictionary are data anchor points, local mm -hmm. anchor points, right? And uh, to encode each data point, you, you, you activate local uh, neighboring uh, anchor point, right? This is approach one. Then the other, the other approach is, okay, for in each local neighborhood, you can still find a um, kind of a local coordinate system Right, they are not necessarily like an anchor point. They can be like a dimensions or like a local PCA type of things, right? And then to when you encode um, this data point, right, it first activate the local coordinate system, right? And then other coordinates kind of keep silent. They are kind of zero, no response, right? So in this way, you also achieve sparsity, right? So this is like a more constructive way to kind of uh, to achieve kind of a sparse coding. So uh, and then actually we have some empirical observations. Um, even you implement this uh, traditional classical sparse coding uh, without any explicit locality constraint, but we empirically observe that there's some kind of a locality in the uh, inner result, right? Um, especially when it works best for classification uh, by using uh, these features, the codes are often found local. Um, then anyway, I think it's preferred to let similar data have similar non-zero di uh, dimensions uh, in their codes. Then uh, we try some experiments. Uh, this, in these experiments, we, we run sparse coding uh, on at least the digit recognition uh, benchmark. Right. Um, so in this case, we try different uh, regularization parameters. Right. So from small to large value. Right. When the regularization parameter is small, that means uh, less sparsity. Right. When the regularization parameter is big, right, the value is big, then that means uh, you put a, a heavier uh, sparsity constraint. Then the result is more sparse. Right. And then uh, this is the, the okay, this data set uh, is uh, uh, 60K uh, digit for training, and then uh, 10K for test, right? So what we do is for each data point, uh, we use uh, sparse coding to get the features, and then try linear SVM to recognize. So that this is a 10 class classification problem. Um, so uh, in this plot, we show different values of the regularization parameter here, the horizontal axis. And this is the classification accuracy, right? And then the same, this is the different values of the regularization parameter. And this is the sparsity you get, kind of average sparsity. So you can see if you increase the value uh, of the regularization parameter, right? You first get a better and better classification uh, accuracy and then drop, right? And then in this case, uh, of course, you, you have a I mean larger and larger value for lambda. You get a, a sparser and a sparser uh, representation, right? Okay, let's take a closer look. So uh, when the, the regularization parameter is small, it's very small, and then the classification accuracy is here, then the sparsity is here. So it's not that sparse because the value is small, right? right. And those are the learned bases and. You don't see too much uh, meaningful uh, result here, right? So uh, seem to be not so meaningful, but not surprising. The result, the classification accuracy is not good either, right? And then uh, you increase the, the regularization parameter, right? And then probably the basis learned uh, uh, slightly more meaningful, right? And uh, you get a sparser uh, representation. And then uh, the, the classification accuracy is is higher, right? And then that's further increase the the lambda value. And in this case, somehow the bases are kind of a more meaningful, right? Each basis you have a, a you can see a very clear um, class association, right? So let's say this is clearly a two. This is clearly eight, right? So it's not like a basis shared by different type of uh, classes. Right, it's kind of clear local association right, to the classes. And uh, indeed, the accuracy here 
is it, it's good. It's the reach the highest uh, uh, point, and then uh, here the 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 the, the sparsity here, uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's very sparse here. And what what happens if we further increase the regularization parameter, right? If you increase the further increase, then what you end up is something like clustering, right? Because uh, in the very end extreme case, you pick up only one basis to represent data, right? Then it's just like a clustering. Then uh, indeed, you can see uh, those bases are clearly like a cluster centers, right? And then the sparsity end up with like only one dimension activated. But the classification accuracy uh, is not good, right? Uh, again, job. So somehow if you, can, if you see the whole uh, experiment, so you end up with when class coding achieves the best uh, classification accuracy, the learning bases are, are kind of like a digit, right? So each digit has a clear local class association. That means uh, actually, uh, even though in this class, uh, canonical sparse coding formulation, we never explicitly implement a uh, locality constraint, but somehow the result uh, is local. Yeah, especially when the desired classification performance is achieved. Right. So actually, we observe we, we observe the similar things for like a, a sparse coding on safety features when you when you uh, achieve. Um, good performance on, on like a, a image classification on Caltech 101 and uh, okay this is a so this is a safety case for uh, image um, image Caltech 101 benchmark um, so so I don't explain uh, I want to explain detail of this plot but I just show like uh, this, the, the the essentially this is showing the the, the, the activated bases are actually very close to the uh, encoded data point. That means the, 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 the sparse coding in this case is local. Right? So, I mean, this is just kind of uh, 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 showing probably, I mean, at least uh, at some, uh, to some extent, explain uh, why sparse coding map, uh, works. Right? If it's not local, I mean, then uh, probably the, the result is, uh, has some issue about stability, right? So if we explicitly uh, enforce some locality constraint, and uh, then you got two things. First, the result is sparse. Second, uh, the coding uh, gonna be uh, much more stable than uh, sparse coding, right? So, so here are, are those reasons. Um, since locality is a preferred property, uh, in sparse coding, then that's uh, explicitly ensure the locality, right? The new algorithm can be um, well theoretically justified, and the new algorithms uh, will have a computational advantage over over uh, classical sparse coding. So let's see. Uh, those are two possible approaches to local sparse coding, and the first one is you look use local anchor points. The second one is using the local subspaces. Right, and we published uh, some uh, for each method. So we published some papers. This is so-called uh, local coding and the coding. The other one is uh, super vector coding, right? And for both methods, I think you will find uh, they are very easy to compute. Um, and in order to develop methods, we uh, we build such a, a a framework to 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 motivate and understand. Uh, the, the, the coding methods. So this is uh, from a functional approximation uh, framework to understand the coding. So those are kind of a data points. This is a data point you want to encode, right? But your purpose is actually to want to learn a nonlinear function in this such an input space, right? And then you do coding, which is a nonlinear mapping uh, to map that data to a new feature space. Right. In this new feature space, it, it, the representation is typically higher dimensional and sparse. And then you apply a linear model on this new feature vector. Right. Because this new feature is a linear mapping of the original data, so this linear function is actually a linear function on next. Right. And you want 
uh, to get a very good, good coding uh, schema, uh, such as this linear function is easier, or it's better, right? OK. So the first approach is uh, uh, local calling and coding. Um, so here's uh, some uh, intuition, a uh, kind of illustration to, to explain why, uh, how it works. Then, uh, okay, so this is uh, a unknown nonlinear target function you want to learn. And suppose those red dots are the bases in your dictionary, right? And you want to figure out the function value as this new input point, right? And the red dot is the value you want to figure out. So what you first do is to, okay, you first do encoding of the input data, of this new data, and then uh, you form a local, uh, local uh, basis uh, to linearly uh, to, to form linear combination to approximate to approximate this data point, right? And and this is actually a sparse representation because uh, you only use the local basis, right? Other basis with uh, uh, zero weight, right? Um, then. We assume the function is locally linear, right? And then um, you can interpret this, uh, this uh, function value as this new data point uh, with uh, kind of linear combination of the function values at this known uh, anchor point, right? So in this case, uh, this is kind of like a local uh, function interpolation. Uh, so we can say something about this uh, function approximation uh, quality, right? So this is the, uh, the approximation value. This is the target value, right? This is a function approximation error, right? This is upper bounded by uh, two terms. The first term is the coding error. That means this is the approximation quality, right? For the, for the input data point. And then this is a kind of like sparse representation uh, weighted by a locality term, which is uh, if the basis is far away from the data point, right, then it will, the distance is big, then it will get a um, bigger penalty, right, will be forced to be encouraged to be zero, right. That means the local data uh, anchor points uh, uh, turn to have non zero weight, right. And, and then, uh, this is kind of a, if you want this function approximation error to be low, then you need to push down this upper bound, right? Um, that means what you learn that there are two things. So in this case, in order to achieve low function approximation error, um, a good coding scheme should have a small coding error, have a small reconstruction error, right? Then the second point should be this coding should be sufficiently local, right? That means only local um, bases are activated, right? So based on this, you can actually uh, develop a very simple algorithm. So first, we just use uh, whatever uh, algorithm, k-means, hierarchical k-means, uh, to, to, to get a dictionary, right? And then uh, this is very simple, right? And then in a coding phase, you don't need to solve a optimization problem, right? You just follow a two steps. First, to ensure locality. That means for this data point x, you find the k nearest the basis in your dictionary, right? So this is like a, in a neighborhood. And then in a second step, you just use those k nearest the basis to reconstruct data, right? With some shift invariance constraint. Right. So to ensure low coding error, right, because of these two terms in upper bound, right. So this is a very simple algorithm, right. There's no, uh, well, there's a, a uh, some uh, optimization, but this is a very easy. You have a closed form solution for this, right. And uh, the next uh, method is not using the like, local anchor point, but kind of a local uh, subspaces like a kernel PCA type of, like a, a local PCA type of things. Uh, this is um, uh, super vector coding. So the, again, we can uh, intuitively explain the, the methods from a function approximation uh, point of view. So 
So those are kind of local bases. Again, those are red dots. And this, you want to figure out uh, the function value, the unknown function value at this location, right? Which is a green dot. And then again, you find the nearest uh, kind of basis, uh, which is this. And so at least the function value, uh, the function at least this red location, uh, suppose you know the, the kind of first order, uh, like a, the local tangent of the function, right? Then you can use this to linearly interpret the function value here, right? Then uh, uh, if you do this everywhere, then what you get is a piecewise uh, local linear uh, function approximation, right? It's kind of first order stuff, uh, local first order approximation. But you can do more, more fancy, like uh, even a higher order, right? I mean, first the partition space, you, have, you use a higher order uh, information to, to, to form the coordinate, local coordinate, right? And uh, this is pretty simple. Uh, this is a function here uh, is a function uh, approximation. And then the whole term here computed the approximation error. So in this case, it's just upper bounded by the quantization error, right? That's uh, completely justified. We just learned uh, k-means uh, by minimize this loss function, this cost, and then to learn the basis, right? And then uh, do simple uh, kind of a coding. So the coding actually uh, method is very simple. Like first, if you learn a dictionary uh, by using k-means or hierarchical k-means, Right, and then um, in a coding phase for, for the new data point x, uh, we obtain its sparse representation in the following way. Uh, step one, uh, we find the nearest basis of uh, x and obtain its vector quantization coding. So here is actually the, the cluster indicator uh, vector, right? Suppose the, this x uh, you know, assigned to the third cluster, then uh, the third element in this uh, VQ indicator vector is one. Other zero uh, elements are zero. Then uh, step two, we just expand this vector quantization coding by you keep the, the original uh, indicator vector and then expand the vector by the local tangent coordinate. Right? Suppose let's say this is the first uh, corresponding the first uh, cluster. Then here is the x, you know, just subtract the mean of the of this third cluster. So it's representing the local tangent uh, coordinate, right? So this is the, 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 the sparse representation, right? You get. Then you apply a linear linear model, right? Then what you get is a piecewise linear function approximation um, to the target function, right? And um, so. So we implemented these methods actually uh, in the first uh, uh, two years, um, yeah, 2010. Uh, ImageNet challenge. This is the first image uh, ImageNet challenge. Uh, it's had, in this challenge, the data set contains 1.4 million images and 1,000 classes. Right. The traditional methods are like back of words with uh, uh, spatial pyramids. You get 40%. Uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, this is the top five hit rate. And then uh, we apply these two methods, we can get a much better uh, result. This is a spot, uh, um, this is super vector coding, this is uh, the LCC coding methods. Also apply linear SVN. But by the way, I think in recently the record has been uh, broken by, I mean, uh, especially by deep learning models, deep neural networks. Uh, Toronto, um, um, Jeff Hinton's student, and also Google guys, they recently developed a kind of a multi layer, kind of, for example, like, I don't know, nine layers of, not nine layers, uh, three, three layers of uh, deep neural networks. And they train the whole system, and the result is better, right? So it's very exciting to see the advance of the whole field. Uh, this is a bit of summarization of uh, these two methods. Uh, this is kind of a very simple way to achieve sparse coding, but without solving the complicated uh, uh, L1 norm 
uh, optimization stuff, right? Uh, but still, we achieve sparsity. But by uh, explicitly ensuring the locality, and we have, I mean, compared to, of course, sparse coding, we have uh, sound uh, theoretical justifications, right? And, and much simpler to implement and compute, uh, and a strong empirical success. Um, well, remember in the first part, very first part of this talk, I, I showed uh, some results indicating deeper models uh, seem to produce better results, right? Since sparse coding is kind of like a building block to achieve, uh, you know, kind of a deeper models, then uh, probably we can do, instead of only one layer sparse coding, we can do multiple layers, right? Actually, there are uh, quite a number of works here uh, done in this direction. So here's uh, uh, one example. So um, remember the first, uh, in the originally, the, 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 we used the sparse coding here, right? And the first two layers essentially done by safe features, kind of like a hand-coded uh, 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 feature e extraction. So now here we, 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 we replace that, the safety feature, by another layer of sparse coding, right? Um, then we learn the whole thing together using the unlabeled data, right? Um, so this is one, uh, one, formula, one way of uh, formulation. So uh, essentially, um, the loss function is the following. So this is like the reconstruction, right? The first layer basis, right? And then you, you kind of uh, have a, a kind of a diagonal matrix, right? Diagonal matrix uh, in this regularization term. And this matrix is itself is a sparse combination of a set of uh, a second layer bases, right? So in this case, you have two layers of, uh, of sparse coding. Uh, you know, um, so you can implement that and then apply the, this unsupervised feature training, this two-layer sparse coding, uh, for example, on MNIST data. Um, so you can pair with a bunch of uh, uh, other methods. Um, so you can see in particular, uh, okay, this is the result, uh, error rate. Um, it's lower than uh, 1%. Um, by the way, uh, okay. So in com in particular, compare with the state of art convolutional neural network on on a list data set, right? Uh, this result is better, comparable or better, right? But remember, oh, a key uh, difference is here: convolutional neural network is completely supervised trained. That means those features are trained supervisedly, right? And in, in this hierarchical sparse coding, the feature training is unsupervised, right? So uh, that's a kind of a, a, that shows the result actually is really competitive. Um, but uh, I would make a comment. Uh, uh, so these days in the deep learning or, or feature learning community, people have really, um, you know, emphasize unsupervised feature training. But we should always keep in mind that uh, uh, supervised feature training is always better, right, if you have enough data, right? If you look at the, uh, some of the published papers, recent published papers, they showed actually, if you have enough data, even use supervised feature training without uh, unsupervised uh, pre-learning, pre-training at all, the performance actually is pretty good. It could be even better, right? So anyway, the, what I'm saying here is uh, uh, in this model, unsupervised training produced very good result, uh, but if you can further in, uh, develop some supervised training methods, uh, you will get a further improvement, yes? Oh, right, so that means uh, this uh, hierarchical model uh, uh, produce better, uh, lower error rate than one layer sparse coding, right? This is a 
By the way, this is a, a sparse coding of directly on the pixels, right? And the result is uh, it, it, it's good, right? Um, but if you add one more layer, uh, you get a better performance. That again shows uh, deeper models. Uh, you by by going deeper, you gain uh, some more advantage, right? Oh, this is a, a kind of sparse coding directly on the images without convolution, right? And this is a kind of similar scene, uh, but with the local coordinate coding uh, without convolution, right? Um, what else? Oh, this is uh, some uh, extended local uh, coding, which is a um, use some some local tangent expansion, which is a paper published uh, in ICML. 2010. Um, I, I didn't uh, introduce here, right? And this is a discriminative sparse coding. Okay, here actually you can see um, this is uh, compared with this one, right? Uh, the same sparse coding without convolution, right? The only difference is this sparse coding is unsupervised trained. This is supervised trained. You can see supervised training. You always get a better performance. Yeah, from 2.1, the error is down to 1.05, right? So what I'm seeing here is, uh, I mean, uh, probably too much overemphasized the answer of the feature training could be a little bit uh, misleading, right? If you could go uh, uh, supervised uh, uh, training, you should do that, right? Okay, so this is kind of like a learned dictionary. Uh, if you look at the, uh, so those dictionary, those bases are the first layer bases, right? But I organize the bases in a way that's the same row of the first layer bases uh, are associated to one particular second layer basis, right? So by this way, I visualize the result. But you can see in a second layer basis, if you look at, this is a second layer, one basis, right? Actually. Same pattern with some kind of uh, variations associated together, right? Uh, with some kind of deformation, translation, even some rotation, right? Here, that means the second layer uh, basis, the response is uh, more invariant, right? But still sufficiently uh, indicative, right? Because they indicate the kind of a, the same sort of type of patterns, right? So that shows uh, why you need to uh, go up a layer, right? Uh, you get a more invariant representation, right? Well, this is uh, on uh, Caltech uh, 101. I, I think that's, uh, this is kind of, um, uh, so when the paper published, this is the first result showing like uh, 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 like deep learning models on Caltech 101, you can uh, uh, you build upon the raw pixels. You can beat the older models, uh, you know, using uh, handcraft features like a uh, saved, right? Yep. But now I think people uh, have achieved a better performance uh, using the deeper models on this. And here's another example uh, of another example of the hierarchical sparse coding. Um, the detailed uh, um, implementation is different, but uh, basically the story is the same. And here you can see uh, one high layer uh, basis actually indicate somewhat, uh, you know, same type of patterns with different uh, kind of variations, right? That means uh, you go upper layer, you obtain, uh, you know, more invariant, but still discriminative enough uh, features, right? All right, so I guess um, I'm almost done. So I, in the end, there are a lot of reasons to work, uh, you know, on uh, extending sparse coding. Mm, I, in this tutorial, um, it's hard to go over all of them, just to mention a few uh, very quickly. So. One is uh, structure the sparse coding. For example, in this work uh, done by uh, Benjo, Sammy Benjo at Google and his colleagues, 
which is called as group sparse coding. That means uh, enforce some spatial consistency. That means uh, 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 features falling in a similar in a local neighborhood in an image, they should have a similar uh, sparse responses. Right? They enforce group sparsity. Instead of the sparsity in constraint is on individual data point, but for a group of data point, a group of local features in a in the neighborhood, right? Um, so this is another way. Uh, this is another work uh, structure. I mean, to enforce hierarchical structure in a dictionary, right? Because the dictionary to learn a very high uh, uh, kind of a wide dictionary, right? Probably it's better to enforce. To explore some interesting structure there. Um, another direction is to scale up sparse coding because uh, traditional sparse coding in a, in a testing time is uh, very uh, time consuming. You need to solve the, the optimization problem. Then uh, uh, this is a feature sign algorithm which is very popular, uh, which is a fast uh, uh, algorithm to solve the kind of a lasso um, problem. And then um, uh, this is a work done by Young's group, and uh, this is using a feed-forward uh, approximation to to approximate. It uses a nonlinear function, a neural network, to approximate the activations of uh, of sparse coding. Um, another way to scale up sparse coding is that you have to learn the the dictionary using a lot of uh, uh, data then uh, how to scale up the training algorithm. They use, uh, they use uh, online learning to, to, to learn a dictionary. Uh, another direction is discriminative training. Uh, for example, those are the backprop type of algorithms to, to learn the dictionary in a supervised way. Right? And this is another work using the supervised uh, dictionary training. Right? Um, all right, uh, I think that's almost the end of uh, this talk. Um, here's a summary. So sparse coding, I hope uh, you are convinced uh, sparse coding is an effective way um, you know, uh, for supervised or for um, at least unsupervised uh, feature learning. And it's a building block for building up deeper models. And sparse coding and its local um, versions um, have pushed the boundary of accuracies on a number of uh, benchmarks like Caltech 101, uh, Pascal, and uh, ImageNet. Um, I think challenge, one challenge uh, is uh, for sparse coding, unlike uh, uh, autoencoder or RBM type of algorithms, uh, typically for sparse coding, uh, several as the training is uh, non-trivial, right? So uh, it's uh, necessary to develop some uh, better algorithm for supervised training, right? All right, thank you.